Well, I am glad to be back. This is the first time I've actually been back in uh, over five years. The last time I was in uh, Felton was in January 2018. So a few things have changed since then. Went from drought to uh, whatever this flood weather is. Uh, I don't want to know how many old historic right-of-ways have now been drowned out that can never be researched uh, on foot now because they just are underwater and washed out. But it's very good to be back here. Uh, and this is the only talk I'm giving the whole time I'm here. So uh, I'm glad that it's here in my hometown. Uh, it's, it really makes me uh, thankful for all you guys to be here. But strange enough, I'm not talking about my hometown. I'm talking about one of the strangest topics I've talked about, which is why Scotts Valley doesn't and never did have a railroad. So rather than talk about Santa Cruz trains, we're talking about not Santa Cruz trains. <laughs> and Scotts Valley. <laughs> Santa Cruz County. So the very first question I have to ask, and it's a very important question because it actually has a lot of answers, is what is Scotts Valley? Defining Scotts Valley is one of the strangest things that I embarked on for this talk. Because there's, there's certain things. You can go back to the old Spanish and Mexican day, well, Mexican days, and Rancho San Agustin is the closest we get to the, the actual city boundaries. It's very similar. So you have this, or, Maybe it's uh, the, what is this one? This is the Scotts family property. So it's actually just this little section here. The Scott family property, what Scotts Valley is named after. Okay, so is that Scotts Valley? That's where it says it's Scotts Valley. Or is it the 95066 uh, zip code? That goes all the way up past Glenwood. And it goes all the way down, way past the modern day Scotts Valley limits. Or the, the broadest extent is the Scotts Valley Unified School District. It goes all the way up to Laurel. That's about as, the only map that you'll see that Laurel is included as part of Scotts Valley. And it also goes almost to Santa Cruz on the south side. So you get all this different range. And then you have the modern city limits. So this is a weird map, I apologize. But the, the blue is the city limits. And the yellow uh, border is the water district boundaries. Don't match 100%. And then you see kind of other areas of interest. All of these could be defined as Scotts Valley, depending on who you're talking to, what period of time you're in, but there kind of is an actual answer to this question. So the whole region started as San Agustin. That was a rancho that was founded in 1833. The Mexican government granted it to Jose Antonio Volkov, who was a Russian who was born as Osip Volkov. Uh, that rancho was then sold to Joseph Ladd Majors in 1841. So Lad Majors was also the one that uh, owned Zianti for a little while. Portion of the rancho was sold to Hiram Daniel Scott of Scotts Valley in 1852. And that's where he built his home, which is still today on Scotts Valley Drive. It's been moved a little bit, but still on Scotts Valley Drive today in 1853. So it's one of the older buildings in the county um, for sure. Uh, the Scott family moved to Santa Cruz in 1853 to follow their uh, family member uh, Hiram. And Captain Daniel Scott ended up being the one that took over the homestead until he died. And they kind of passed along to various members of the family for several years. Parts of it were subdivided. And that's where the name Scotts Valley actually first seems to appear in at least uh, newspaper records is when the, one of the subdivisions in 1862 uh, called the property Scotts Valley. And so that's where you get the first kind of mention of Scotts Valley as an actual location by that name. But clearly it's a reference to the Scott family whether it's Hiram or another member. But so there's a couple other things that are important during this time. The old Franciscan trail, it was a route that the, that the Franciscan monks and other people associated with the Spanish mission and then later the Mexican uh, government used to cross the mountains between Santa Clara and Santa Cruz. They used this route and it seemed to cut right through Scotts Valley. And it, it makes some sense. You've all been to Scotts Valley. Scotts Valley's a big floodplain. And that's really nice because that means there's going to be spots in it where you can take your wagon, you can take your horses without having to encounter big, thick forests or anything like that. It's actually a much more open space than really anywhere else in the mountains. By 1848, though, when California was annexed to uh, the United States, there was very little people living there, if anyone, and the road was just completely in shambles. So calling it a road at that point, it really lived up to its trail name by 1848. But the county, they wanted a connection. They needed a connection over the mountains. So in 1850, 
uh, I think it was 1856, but in 1858, it was completed in October. Um, what was officially called the Santa Cruz Turnpike, what was very popularly known as McKiernan's Toll Road, that says in Mountain Charlie McKiernan. And today, it's part of it at least is known as Mountain Charlie Road um, up to the summit. The southern portion of it is the Glenwood Drive. And so that kind of became the core road through Scotts Valley, even in the earliest time. So this is 1858. So, you know, there's not a lot of people living in Santa Cruz County as a whole at this time. And so now we're getting this road that goes to the mountains. It's still not super well developed and it's a toll road. And so a toll road needs toll gates. So the top one was controlled by McKiernan and the southern one was controlled by the Scott family. And so between these two points, everybody had to pass and they all paid a little toll to get through there. Early settlement areas in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, in the vicinity of Scotts Valley at this time, this is gonna be important for later. You have the Scotts Valley estate of the Scott family and the people that they've sold some land to. That roughly is equivalent to the Bank of America building today was where the homestead was, but it got later moved back to, uh, from the road. Uh, importantly for any community, the schoolhouse was first built in Scotts Valley in 1865, and it's roughly where today's middle school is on Scotts Valley Drive. The next community, and you're gonna hear this one a couple times throughout this talk, is Vine Hill. You don't think of Vine Hill as a major area of Scotts Valley, but it was actually one of the major draws in the mountains at the time. So it was near, along one of the headwater streams of Branson Forty Creek. It was renowned for its vineyards, hence Vine Hill. Uh, in fact, uh, Donald Clark is, sp speculates that there's actually no place actually called Vine Hill. I disagree, I think one of the hills probably was called Vine Hill, but the community is called that. Uh, it was developed by George and John Jarvis originally from in the early 1860s, and the school there was built on uh, the former Jarvis estate in 1870. So again, school, very important to community. Uh, what you guys know as of Scotts Valley today is kind of the heart of Scotts Valley is probably going to be somewhere near the intersection of today's Scotts Valley Drive and Mount Hermon Road. That was called Camp Evers. It was developed uh, by Edward N. Evers uh, as an auto camp in 1921, but that was only in 1940s and 1947s when the post office for Scotts Valley actually opened. So it's almost 90 years after all the rest of this stuff's happening. So the core of Scotts Valley today, and we're gonna show some pictures, I'm gonna show some pictures there, was not what you were thinking. So just to show some pictures of the area, you're gonna see more photos of Glenwood and Vine Hill than anything in this talk. And that's because Scotts Valley does not have very many photos from this early period. And so you have this camp in Glenwood in 1883. Dates won't always exactly match up. You have this really fun picture. This is later, but I think the, the feeling is right. So you have this nice uh, cyanotype of a hunter near Glenwood in 1910, this little mountain camp. Uh, and then this is Vine Hill, just looking towards the forest a little bit. And then as any lifeblood in the mountains, uh, or anybody in the mountains knows the lifeblood used to be the lumber industry. So there was a lumber mill. There was quite a few lumber mills uh, in the Glenwood area. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. So all of you guys are here for railroads. So what, what's the appeal of Scotts Valley to a railroad? You got a couple things. You got lumber. That's pretty much it. You have lumber. Um, okay, so you have lumber. So you have lumber, and the problem is that the lumber, Scotts Valley, as I mentioned earlier, is a floodplain. There's not actually a lot of lumber in Scotts Valley. There's plenty of areas around Scotts Valley that have lumber, but it's sand hills. It's not great soil for redwood trees and everything. So the real appeal for the railroad to cut through that specific spot was actually two resorts, namely two resorts. It was uh, De Wolf's. This is a weird one you may never have heard of. De Wolf's Magnetic Springs was on Bean Creek Road. You may know it better as Summer Home Farm because that's what it turned into a few years later. That was run by John Wesley DeWolf and his father, Benjamin R. DeWolf, whose names are not spelled the same and I do not know why. <laughs> uh, that resort started in 1875, so right when the railroads are starting to survey through the mountains. And then the much more famous Magnetic Springs is Glenwood Magnetic Springs, which is on Vine Hill Road, which I just had a picture of a minute ago. That one there, um, although that's not the resort itself. And that was run from 1877 by Andrew J. Height. And he's from New York. And so contrary to popular belief, I believe that Glenwood was actually probably named after Glenwood in New York and that it was Height's uh, Glenwood Magnetic Springs where the name came from. So that, that's my hot take. Take it as you will. Um, 
So by 1880, um, the general industries in the area were dairy, rural farming, rural ranching, there's some apple orchards, and there's the whole vine industry, or uh, vineyard industry, and that's both wine grapes and table grapes were being grown there. But it just, it wasn't a good area for mass settlement. And one of the main reasons was because of that floodplain, it wasn't actually a good stable place to grow a house because every time it rained, uh, the creek, Carbonara Creek would flood and so you'd have to build up on the hillside. So it wasn't really that interesting of an area to go and it's still a little bit out of the ways. Okay, so last point, by the 1880s, they are trying to actually market Scotts Valley as a place to live. Not just like a couple advertisements, but the newspapers actually saying like, come on guys, you gotta move here, there's lots of land. So railroads, it's taking notice, but it's not taking that much notice. So the South Pacific Railroad started serving in the mountains in 1877, and 1878 is when they finally decide their route. And they had a couple of things that they really wanted. They wanted to reach Soquel Creek. The primary reason for that is Frederick Keene owned almost all of Soquel Creek in that area. And if the railroad could go there, Keene could get his lumber out. Railroad wanted lumber, Keene wanted to sell his lumber. It was a very convenient spot. So Soquel Creek, goal number one. That single goal almost completely derailed even the San Lorenzo Valley having much of a railroad route because they almost just built the railroad straight down Soquel Creek and went to Soquel. So almost all of this area, this was service, in fairness, this was serviced by a small railroad at the time, but we almost got left off of the entire mainline route. So they were just gonna go to SoCal. But fortunately, the people in the San Lorenzo Valley said, we want access to the, San, uh, to the Santa Clara Valley also. So they said, you need to come to us. And it really was beneficial that uh, the Santa Clara Valley Mill and Lumber Company run by the Doherty brothers was located on Zioni Creek in the 1870s because that was a huge draw. If we can get the train to Zioni Creek, then we can ship out lumber from there. And that's a huge company. At the time, it was one of the largest lumber firms in the South Bay. They really wanted to get their stuff out of there and the railroad wanted to help this process. So what's right between? So we're in SoCal. SoCal and San Lorenzo Valley. What's right between there? Scotts Valley. Scotts Valley was a route along the way that was convenient. <laughs> So they're trying to cut costs. Oh, and they also benefited from the fact that because there was a railroad up to Felton from Santa Cruz at the time, if they bought that, they could just upgrade it and have that as their main railroad route. So that's exactly what they did. So just a couple photos. This is one of the earliest photos we have of Scotts Valley. I don't know for sure if this is Scotts Valley Drive or just another rural road there, but you can see it's trees, but it's also big grassy areas. The colorization's mine, so. Apologize if you don't like it, um, but here's a little <laughs> breakdown of some of the roads. Uh, so the main roads to the area, that's also important. There were other smaller roads. These are the main ones. But so you have Mountain Charlie Road, which is going there. That became Glenwood Drive. It became Scotts Valley Drive and it's Mountain Charlie at the top. You have Glenwood Magnetic Springs on Vine Hill Road here. This little cutover used to be the original route to connect them. So this was built after the railroad as well as a little wiggly bit there. Um, you have Zayani Road over there, which no, no connection. And then you have this, which is the SoCal Turnpike, San Jose SoCal Road, which is over here. Again, no connections between them. So you really have these three resorts. Hotel de Redwood was completely disconnected from everybody else at this time. It was a waypoint on the SoCal Road. But this is a photo of the last turn going into uh, Scotts Valley on today's Glenwood Road, but you can see it's very early on. This is before Glenwood Highway was built. So very rural, very rough there. Oh, but I do like, you can look in the distance here and you can see it's quite an open plain at this time. So there's not a lot of tree cover. Again, that's not actually that appealing to a lot of uh, settlers at the time. The problem was this was the most convenient route from Soquel to San Lorenzo Valley was through what we consider a part of Scotts Valley, but it was the northern part of Scotts Valley. It's far north of the city limits today. It cut through what eventually became known as Glenwood. I believe it got called Glenwood because that was the spot that you got off to get on to the Glenwood Magnetic Springs. It makes perfect sense. It was our original stop there. And there really wasn't, in fact, here's a photo right here. This is what Glenwood looked like about 1880. That's a station, there's a train, there's nothing else there. It's a complete, there's no hotel, there's no general store. It's a complete open field and meadow. It's just, a, but you can see the vineyards up on the hill. Like it, there was a big vine, uh, wine industry in the area, but we're talking about an area that is not actually that appealing for the railroad. It's just convenient. The railroad's trying to get the fastest route through. That happened to be the fastest route there. 
So the problem for the local resorts and even for some of the lumber firms was they weren't nearby. So some of the lumber firms shipped out from Glenwood, some of them shipped out from Laurel. They just go to whichever one was closest. The Glenwood Lumber Company started off in Glenwood, but it actually moved to Laurel into the Glenwood Basin, which is probably why it's called that. And so Glenwood, so even the local lumber firms aren't kind of staying loyal to their names. And so the resorts are the other big draw. And at this time, the resorts were still kind of in their infancy. So it took a three, a three mile wagon ride from here to get to either the Glenwood Magnetic Springs or about two miles to get to Summer Home Farm slash, it, by that point it was becoming Summer Home Farm. And those were really the only, the only tourist draws. So naturally some of the local people there were thinking, we should make more tourist draws. So one of the very first things was Charles Martin, who was kind of the unofficial mayor of the area because he owned a lot of it. He formed Glenwood Park. And he may have built a hotel there. There's very little evidence that the hotel existed until the 1890s, but he may have built a hotel as early as 1883. But Glenwood Park was really a big draw. So you get a lot of tourists going up on the train. They go right up to Glenwood, then they get off and hang out at the park for a couple hours, and they take the train back to San, uh, San Jose or San Francisco. But again, so we're not really seeing a whole lot of settlement in the area. Just after the railroad was built, you can see, I've done this chart, the black line is the railroad line. Those stops are all ones that were in 1902, so I jumped ahead a little. But you can see there's stops, there's two in the Laurel Canyon, two Glenwood and Clems in the Glenwood area, right across the Little Mountain Charlie Tunnel. So this is now in the Zayani watershed. You have three in quick succession, Virginia, Tank Siding, and Zayanti. Then a little bit further down, Doherty should be Meehan by this point. So you have Meehan slash Doherty, Eccles, I apologize, I forgot to put Mount Herman on here, but Mount Herman was there by 1902. And then you have Felton Big Trees and Felton Junction. So you have quite a lot of stations in this little stretch, but the only ones that are really accessing areas in the Scotts Valley area are Laurel and Glenwood. So Laurel became the stop for Hotel de Redwood, which is on the SoCal uh, Branch of Forty Ridge. And they, that little pink line is the little road that they built, which is today Redwood Lodge Road which is washed out, but hopefully someday it will come back. <laughs> and then you have from Glenwood, the hotel eventually did get built there uh, by 1902. It was 1894 that I believe it was first advertised. Villa Fontenay, a little bit further south in the Vine Hill area. Glenwood Magnetic Springs is still kicking around. And then this road here, which was the old Vine Hill Road and now Vine Hill School Road, that one stayed as a nice connecting between the two. But yeah, you can see uh, there also is a couple uh, Gibbs Resort Gibbs Resort is interesting because while it was, it, today it would be considered part of the Glenwood area from Weston Road. Back at that time, it was only accessible by Zianti. So I included here just so you guys know, and I did put it in my new book, but it's actually technically a Zianti stop. And then uh, Mount Pleasant Farm, which I know very little about because no photographs seem to exist of Mount Pleasant Farm. I don't know why. Kind of sad for a resort. So the bigger question is population. So. We're trying to get, why are people living in, or people in Scotts Valley, like they've been left off of this major railroad line through the mountains. Okay, why have they been left off? Is there a population to justify it? Well, no. <laughs> and the entire, the, it's a very vague, rough estimate, I have to admit, because the, the statistic or the data is really not there, but there's only about 300 people living in the Scotts Valley area at this time. It's very difficult to actually determine where exactly the population centers were. We know there are people living in Glenwood. We know there's people living in Laurel. We know there's people living in Scotts Valley, but how, how much, uh, where they were concentrated is really difficult to find out. Winemaking and dairying are still the only major industries in the area, and that's also super important because those are things that don't really need to train. You can put those on wagons and wagon them out. The, there's not a ton of lumber activity, surprisingly, in the upper Scotts Valley area. There's some, but a lot of that was logged out pretty early on. So you're not really getting a whole lot of a draw. And I have a population stat. Just, so this is for all of Santa Cruz County. You can see 1880s right there. It's, it's not a big population. The entire county was, in 1880, it was 12,802 people. So that's for the entire county. That includes two cities because Watsonville and Santa Cruz already have populations. So the whole rest of the county, if we say half of that's in the cities, that means 6,000 people across a huge area. And so there's just not a lot of draw. So I'm not saying that there was any reason they went to Glenwood and Laurel. I'm saying 
there was no reason for them to go anywhere in the mountains. It really was just a, we need to get from point A to point B and Scott's Valley and Glenwood is in the way. And so that's why they did it. This is one of my favorite photos of some kids, probably from Boulder Creek School, visiting the Mountain Charlie Tunnel for some reason. <laughs> Don't know why they're there. Uh, so let's talk about the two communities that did exist. I've already mentioned them a little bit, but so we have Glenwood. Glenwood is what for all intent and purposes was the Scotts Valley Station. That was where the railroad met Scotts Valley. And yes, it's a little bit out of the way, and today it's more than it, it seems further than it used to be, but that used to be the station. So it had a whole lot of things. It was uh, access for Glenwood Magnetic Springs, as well as all the other resorts that developed in the area. Uh, the station opened there right at the very beginning in May 1880. It was also a camp during construction, so that brought some interest to the area. Post office opened there in August 1880, right at the beginning. General store was opened by 1881. Uh, hotel facilities were already starting to pop up by the late 1880s. Glenwood Park, uh, sorry, um, Glenwood School was founded in 1886. And so again, communities are, they need a couple of things to really be transitioned from just a rural outpost to something more. You need a post office, you need a school, you need a general store of some sort. And Glenwood checked all the boxes. In fact, it's the only one that really checked the boxes in the Scotts Valley area at this time. And so on the other side of things, you have Vine Hill. Vine Hill was a little bit of a step down. It had a two resorts, but it, Vine Hill School opened in 1870, so it has school, but it didn't really have a store and it never had a post office. And so those are, those are interesting. It's a little less of a population center, but it also wasn't as much of a crossroads because uh, that was the other thing. Glenwood also was a crossroads. Besides the railroad reaching there, that was also how you could easily get to Vine Hill or Scotts Valley or up north to Summit. So it's got a, it's got a little triangle there. You can go different directions. Oh, and in case anybody's interested, uh, Villa Fontenay was named after a French couple, the Mel de Fontenay family. So they happened to own it prior to the actual people who opened the resort, but apparently it was classy enough that they went with that name. So this photo I absolutely love. It shows, this is from right across, when you got off a train at Glenwood, this is what you'd see. You'd see these advertisements, this is right about 1900. You'd see all the local resorts and they're trying to say, go to our resort. And there would be wagons waiting for you uh, to take you to all these different resorts. And it was just like a great little thing up in the mountains. So some of the resorts, here's Glenwood Magnetic Springs. You get this nice view looking across it, um, across maybe Vine Hill, <laughs> the Vine Hill area. And this is right in front of that resort. So you see this nice, um, the Magnetic Springs, both of them um, were meant partially as a medicinal thing. You'd go there, they were called magnetic because they claimed that the water ran over iron rich sources. So it was more of iron. It's completely a scam, but it was great and they loved it. <laughs> There's no evidence that the, the water's there because the, the stream still runs. There's no evidence that that stream actually has any magnetic pro uh, properties that make it unique, but it was a great marketing tactic. It got people out there and they go there. They go up in the mountains. They'd spend a whole summer. That was like the thing you did before about 1910, before automobiles kind of made things all fast. You'd go up in the mountains for a month, maybe two months. And having the train close by was really convenient because in those days, it would usually be the wife and the kids would go up for the full summer and the husbands would go back to San Francisco during the week and they'd do business. And then on the weekends, they'd come back to the mountains and they'd hang out for the weekends and they'd just do that all summer long. It was just like life. So you see all these kids here, like it, Glenwood Magnetic Springs was a little bit more of a medicinal resort, but some of the other ones were just hang out in the woods. You go hunting, horseback riding. So very much like kind of dude ranch stuff now. That was what you did. So that's what all of these were. So uh, summer home, for, most of them also had their own vineyards and farms. So summer home farm very much exuding its vineyard in the foreground. It's got, uh, got some uh, fruit trees in the mid ground there. You can see. So this, this is now the, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember, Salvation Army Camp, I believe? Yeah. So it's still there, right on Bean Creek Road. And this was Sand Hill School. Uh, it eventually moved to, to over the uh, tunnel to Laurel, but the original school was here. And this was in 1896 when the first infantry was doing some maneuvers in the area and decided to walk through and they raised the American flag there just to kind of do this cool ceremony. They did it all over. Like they have a kind of like day by day record. They did camps around. Um, I think they were camped at Glenwood for, I want to say three or four days. They, they escaped right before a storm hit. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Seems familiar. Uh, Villa Fontaine, this is a, a cyanotype of Villa Fontaine. So again, it looks very similar to Glenwood Mag Magnetic Springs, same area. And then there's the Vine Hill School that was located on the Villa F uh, Fontenay property. All right, so I, I, I've lingered long enough with Scotts Valley, uh, avoiding Scotts Valley, having a train. So was there ever an idea to have a train in Scotts Valley? And there's been twice ideas to have trains in Scotts Valley. So I will go over the first one, and then I will go over the second one. The first one was in 1908. And I'm going to do this as a little piecemeal because it tells a bit of a story. So... In 1906, the railroad got damaged in an earthquake. The summit tunnel that connects Laurel with Wrights and therefore connecting the mountains uh, got severely damaged because the fault, San Andreas Fault goes right through it. And so because of that, all traffic south of Laurel was through traffic on narrow gauge and all traffic north of the tunnel at Wrights was standard gauge. And slowly but surely, they upgraded all the tunnels and upgraded all the tracks so they could all support standard gauge. So after they repaired the summit tunnel, they then closed down the Glenwood Laurel Tunnel. And so Laurel was now on the standard gauge route, but Glenwood was now the, term the northern terminus. So it kind of like moved around a bit and they're upgrading the tracks. So during this, Southern Pacific got really creative. They did several proposals. They did one for a San Lorenzo Valley, which would have had our train go all the way up the valley. I think the 1908 one was, it was now that, in 1908, it was going to go all the way over to Saratoga. They had another one a few years later that was going to go up Kings Creek Road and over all the Los Gatos from a different direction. So you got these different routes that were being proposed. But they had one for Scotts Valley, too. And that's interesting. So they investigated this route after pretty much a year of the Sentinel just writing letters to, or editorials. The Sentinel loved writing editorials about things they wanted and they, they'd wish them into being, but they actually would never really happen. <laughs> so they, they just write and write, go like, come on, you gotta do this. And so in 1907, they started advocating like, let's, let's get a route that goes from Glenwood to, uh, to uh, Santa Cruz via Scotts Valley because it would save three miles from the route, which is more or less correct. And it was completely feasible. So like, let's go with this. So. They kept writing, they kept writing, they kept proposing it. And so finally, Southern Pacific seemed to acquiesce. And so they, they, one of the big goals that Southern Pacific stated, at least it's a little confusing. I'll, I'll explain the confusion later. I'm building up to it. <laughs> one of the things was that would remove sharp turns. Now, if any of you have taken the Big Trees train to Santa Cruz on Roaring Camp, like the Roaring Camp um, Beach train, it curves a lot and there's landslides a lot and it can't go that fast. Well, that's never changed. That's been that way since that route was built in 1875. That is not efficient for a, a efficient railroad system. So if you could build a railroad that would just go straight down from Glenwood, which is, it was just outside Glenwood and, and Zayani Creek that this curve started. If you could go straight down, you'd eliminate all these curves. It sounds like a great idea. Okay, so Southern Pacific seems to be going along with this because some of their agents are saying like, yes, this sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Always got a note. Scotts Valley was not the goal of this route. Once again, Scotts Valley still does not have that many people living there in 1908. It's got more people for sure, but Scotts Valley is still not the goal. The goal is to eliminate curves and cut three miles from the route and get to Santa Cruz. So sorry, Scotts Valley, you're still getting left out. So this was the proposed route. And I think it's, I had to chart this out. It's a fascinating route. So you'd go from Glenwood, right? Pretty much where the Mountain Charlie Tunnel is today, which when, the, when you're taking a Glenwood Drive, right when you cross over Bean Creek uh, for the first time, the tunnel is on the left. So it's right around there. And so if you're going south, it would have followed Bean Creek Road for a very short distance, like Glen, uh, Glenwood Drive and then Bean Creek Road for a very short distance. And where Summer Home Farm is, it would have cut through the mountain range through a tunnel. Uh, the tunnel would have been about 2,000 feet. So it's a decent sized tunnel. It would have popped you out uh, near the top of Sand Hill, um, north of Scotts Valley, and then just gone straight down the valley for uh, quite a distance, cross modern day 17 today, cross Carbonara Creek, and then go in this little gully that I was able to find on map, so it's still, it's still there, uh, little gully off of Carbonara Creek that will cut you over to Granite Creek Road. And so that tunnel would still be a decent one, it's about 1,700 feet. And then from there, it would just go south down Granite Creek Road, down Branson 40 Road, or, Drive, drive, um, all the way down 
to where it lets out in Santa Cruz. At Santa Cruz, it would pretty much cross over to Highway 17. Highway 17 is actually a very complicated cut, hill cut and whatnot there. So they would have gone through with a short little tunnel of just about 200 feet, cross over San Lorenzo River near the tannery, and then rejoin the main route. And so had they done this, this would have cut three miles. It, you can see it is a very straight curve. This thing is actually super wobbly all the way around. Like I can't get it on this level. Super wobbly little road. This would have been super smooth. And so it really would accomplish with the goal. And it would have been wonderful for Scotts Valley people because suddenly Scotts Valley would be right on the main line. And yeah, and then they would have de um, demoted the old line into, they pretty much would have cut back the Zianti portion and turned it into a really long Boulder Creek branch all the way from Santa Cruz. So that was the, what they were talking about. And then they also threw in some other things. This is where the railroad gets really interesting with its, they're trying to get support for something, but you don't quite know what. They also said, oh yeah, we'll be double tracked. We're gonna electrify it. They have made these promises so many times in the histories, it's kind of ridiculous. So it was gonna be this huge thing. And then it was revealed on, I have the, sorry, I have the wrong date on there. Uh, it was revealed on November 18th, 1908, uh, that Southern Pacific actually had no plans to build this route. Their surveyors were out there doing survey work. In fact, they did two surveys. Their entire goal was to resurvey records that had been lost in the 1906 earthquake. <laughs> so they were teasing everyone for almost a year to show it. They're doing the survey, they're talking to the press and everything, and they had no actual plans to build this route. This was apparently, at least according to one uh, report, this was apparently them reserving an old South Pacific Coast Railroad route that they had, that hadn't made the news really back in 19, or in uh, 1876 or 77. And it was just one of those early plans. They had, at one point, they had been planning to bypass the Santa Cruz and Felton Railroad to do their own route because Santa Cruz and Felton was playing a little bit hardball. So maybe this was one of their alternate, alternate plans. Who really knows? There's very little evidence of them actually doing the survey back in the 1870s, but that's what Southern Pacific actually said. So 1906 fire though, I can attest because I've looked for records. A lot of stuff got lost during that fire. Every, the entire records office in San Francisco got lost. So I'm not surprised if the story is actually true. Why they're scamming everyone, that's a different issue. <laughs> so, so the sad part of the story is the one that you guys know. I will get back to the second proposal, so don't worry. The sad part of the story is that the railroad didn't do that route. They didn't do any more routes. All the routes in the county that existed as of about 1910, that was the maximum extent they ever got. And from that point on, they started cutting back passenger service, they started cutting back freight, they started cutting back the tracks themselves, they started abandoning tracks across the county, until you get to a point where we just have our main trunk line along the coast up to Davenport, and we have the route to uh, the Roaring Camp route, which technically stops at Eccles, but you know, nobody really takes the train past Mount Hermon for anything. And so that, that happened slowly. And with the collapse of the railroad, you had, in the exact opposite, you had the rise of the automobile. And the automobile was interesting because it actually kind of hurt. It was promoted. The railroad was promoted by all the local resorts because they said, this will be great. All the people will come into the mountains and they can come on their own now. They don't have to rely on the trains. It completely killed the summer culture though, because people would come up and they'd stay, oh, we just wanna stay for a few nights. And then they, you know, you'd stay for the weekend and then they go back, which is how most of us vacation nowadays. Like you, you go for a few days, maybe you'll go to a different place, maybe you'll just go for the weekend. And the railroads kind of made it a little bit harder so you actually would spend the time there, but life really sped up after the automobile started. And so in Glenwood, and really Scotts Valley, you have the rise of the Glenwood Highway. So starting in the mid 1910s, the Glenwood Highway project started, which was a full concrete highway from Los Gatos to Santa Cruz. It was promoted heavily with all the resorts and Charles Martin, especially uh, from Glenwood, he donated land for the route. He provided resources for a route and he, has a, he had his uh, feet print, I believe, in the concrete across from his hotel because he was that proud of the route. It was one of the last things he did before he died. And it was, or contributed to before he died. Yet the funny thing is, they pretty much killed all of Glenwood because Glenwood no longer had any reason for people to go except to stop to get some gas. Well, they stop, they get some gas, maybe buy a treat from the general store, then they drive on. And that same thing happened to Laurel. 
Laura was already smaller, and so that just didn't help at all. Um, these are some early photos of them building the, the Glenwood Highway in the Glenwood area. And then this is a shot that's almost exactly the same as that shot I showed you much earlier with it now paved. This may still be from about 19, uh, 18, 19, 19 though, because it doesn't seem that there's any lines on the road and they did eventually put lines on the road. And then this, as I said, stopping for gas and getting a snack. Here's a Model T right in front of the Glenwood uh, Post Office and General Store. So you have the mountains declining as, <laughs> as automobiles increase. And so one by one, all the resorts start closing. Most of them closed and became private residences. A few of them switched to other uses. Um, like the Salvation Army camp, like they, they sold, they sometimes passed through a couple of hands. One of them became one of the weirdest religious movements called the Now People. They seem to have been nudists. It's not clear. <laughs> at least <laughs> 1910s free love, at least. No so <laughs> not that I found. <laughs> I did find an advertisement for it, but it's not here. It was a bad, it was a low quality advertisement, unfortunately. But yeah, so you have these, these things starting to develop like a new mountain culture, which isn't as much reliant on the trains. It's not reliant on the resorts. It's, it's more like we have today, which people live in the mountains just to kind of have their rural lifestyles and they can kind of do whatever they want. And so that started in really the 1920s. And uh, by the time the railroad left in 1940, like it was almost a footnote. People weren't using it for commuter service. The reports at the time pretty much had the railroad kind of just it kind of was like when it first went there. It was just passing through. People weren't stopping at the railroad most of the time. Like, so it, it's, it was sad how it ended. So Scotts Valley did not have a, much of a stake in the game when the railroad was petitioned to abandon. And yeah, just a couple other photos of the Glenwood area. There's a lot of cars and tractors there. <laughs> I actually can't figure out what the acronym King stands for. Uh, I've tried to look it up. I've had no luck. Uh, and then this is showing, so with the fall of Glenwood and the railroad area, what rose was Camp Evers. So Camp Evers really started to rise at this time because it was at the important crossroads where you could go to Mount Hermon you, and Felton and San Luis Valley. You could go up north and you can go to Santa Cruz. So like the center, that little, that Y where people went to different directions moved south. And there's no railroad there, but that's okay. By, by the mid 1940s, it's okay because you don't need the railroad anymore. I have a couple aerial photos here, which I, this one's really interesting. This shows uh, Glenwood in 1931, just to show kind of how quiet the area's gotten. You can see, see, yeah. So the station is, this is the like station center right here. And so the station with the general store and a couple buildings right across the way. It's not that developed. This is 1930s. And like, you know, there weren't demolishing houses. So the people had lived there, they're still living there, but it's not that busy of an area. You can see a couple of vineyards up over on the left there, but it, it's a quiet area. Um, I'll show you one for Scotts Valley in just a minute. So, and then this is Glenwood, the very last year. This is actually after the tracks were abandoned, or railroad was abandoned, but the, the station was removed in 1939. Again, just showing that was before they even knew they were going to be abandoning the railroad the next year. So they already were pretty much done with Glenwood. So yeah, there wasn't much, the railroad gets abandoned in 1940. There's not a whole lot of talk anymore of what the railroad, because right now we're in the height of the car era and then World War II starts. And so we go from height of the car era to World War II to after World War II, where you're still in that kind of like, everybody needs to have a car, everybody needs to have their own house. So you're getting some settlement up there. In fact, if anything, you're getting a lot of settlement in the Scotts Valley and Glenwood area, but it's not, a, it's all about owning cars. It's all about owning your own houses. And so one of the big developments, just to jump ahead, is Sky Park. Sky Park in 1946, it's like, that's a big new thing. You can own a private plane now. Like, they're cheap enough that you can buy your own one, and you have this little airport up in the hills. That's really cool. I mean, they had other ones. They had one in Boulder Creek, I believe. Like, they had, they had ones all over the place. And so that was a big development. You don't need trains anymore. You can just fly there. But there was still some interest in the railroad. So by 1977, as we all know, commuter traffic over 17 was starting to get a little tough and not a lot has changed on 17 <laughs> since 17 opened in 1940. Like the, the 17 that we know of today mostly existed in 1940 with one interesting exception on both ends actually. In Los Gatos and Scotts Valley, 17 still went down the main roads. 
And so you didn't have those bypasses. The bypass in Scotts Valley mostly goes really down Carbonara Creek. If you look at a map, they've pretty much culverted Carbonara Creek and put the road where it used to be. Scotts Valley is the same thing. The, the, the highway goes right down Los Gatos Creek and Los Gatos Creek is at culvert. That, so the, in both places, it used to actually go down the main road. And so it was not eff efficient at all. So in 1977, Highway 17, or a proposal went out by the Department of Transportation, California, to build an electric road that would pass through Scotts Valley. And so there's a couple different proposals that, or a couple different ideas. We could restore the old route, which is gonna have the same problems. It's up in Glenwood. Nobody lives, I mean, people live in Glenwood, but not the population center. And by this point, there was a population, 1970s, there's a population in Scotts Valley. So sending a train to Glenwood doesn't make sense. Another idea, which always is being thrown around, is restore the Suntan Special. Well, that won't help anybody in Scotts Valley or even the San Lorenzo Valley because the Suntan Special is along the coast. So the big idea was, let's build an electric railroad right down the middle of Highway 17. Cool concept, um, couple notes, there's curves and hills on the road and <laughs> it's, not, it's not impossible, but man, it would be an expensive route. And so the feasibility study pretty much said, possible, yes, affordable, absolutely not. And the funniest thing is, in 1995, that exact same proposal for an electric railroad right down the middle of 17 was pitched again. And yeah, you know, 18 years of new research suggests maybe they have some more technology, but it still was not feasible. But the thing in, in 1995 that was really interesting is they had a new idea. Let's do a Scotts Valley route. We'll do the old route, but do a Scotts Valley branch. And that was really interesting. And so, the route they chose would have gone all the way to almost Felton. It's unclear if they would have actually gone to Felton. By that point, that railroad was owned by Roaring Camp, so not sure what they were planning for that. But this would have gone all the way to the quarry that you can see when you're going over Mount Irvine Road, right at the very top, before you start going into the Zianti Valley, you see where the trucks used to go and there's a couple turns. That quarry, it would have gone right up to the top of that quarry as far as it could, its grade could handle, and they would have gone through a tunnel. I don't have the length for a tunnel, but it would have been a pretty short one. I will have popped you up in the Bean Creek Valley at Lockhart Gulch. And then Lockhart Gulch is even enough that it would have popped them up all the way over to Sky Park. You could, I, I've looked at it. It's, a, it's surprisingly at even grade. I think you, they could have done it pretty well. And so it would have gone right up to Sky Park, met at, Cap, at Kings Village, right where they have the Highway 17 Express today. And then it would have just gone down Highway 17 from there. Still a little mountainy in 17, but you know, it's a smaller stretch, so maybe that was possible. So, cool idea. Unfortunately, politics in 1995 completely undermined the feasibility study, and so right as the study came out, uh, there was a whole political tide that changed, so there was no chance it would have actually happened. It was really sad because they'd been working on the study for a couple years. So, the cool news was they had a feasible route. The sad news was that the money wasn't there again. Um, just to get, this is the other aerial photo I really like. I apologize for putting it so late in the tour, but I think, or in the, the talk, but you can see this is Scott's Valley in right when the railroad was abandoned. <laughs> There's a Scott House, um, Highway 17, which is Scott's Valley Drive. It was Highway 17 by this point, but you can see. So this is where 17 kind of takes off today, but this is still Scott's Valley Drive. You can see Mount Herman Road over there, which at the time was Conference Drive, um, from where Conference Drive takes off. And then Bean Creek Road up there. So again, there's not a lot of people here. If you, I should have done a comparison because if you compare this to today, this is all developed. It's, I mean, the mountains, the trees are still, a lot of those trees are still there, but all of this area is developed with businesses, with homes. It's just crazy to think how, like this is why there wasn't a railroad because even in 1940, people weren't living here. So, I mean, this is Sky Park. <laughs> this is, this is Mount Herman Road. I mean, this is, this is King Shopping Center. This is the, the Target's over there. Like, you can just see, like, there's nothing here. And that, so to conclude this talk, there, it's, a, it's a sad ending, I know. It, indecision is one of the main problems. Lack of money, lack of political support. Um, the long process it takes to get things done. You may have a whole government, the entire county governments could be behind something like, I mean, this would be a big project because you're literally making an entirely new railroad route. But you go from that, and by the time you actually can implement it, you have the political, 
tides have shifted and fun, you know, the reality of how much it's going to cost. So it always causes problems with this. Um, the good news is it is entirely feasible. I still argue today that restoring the route, it would be extremely expensive. It would definitely need some good investors, but it's at least technically feasible. So that it's something to keep in mind. And I think a route from the South to Scotts Valley, like that one that they proposed in 1995, I think that's entirely feasible once other things go first. And that's the main, that's always my main point is we already have railroad lines, focus on those first, and then we work on adding new stuff. But I think there's a possibility always. But yeah, my, my sad little face, it's not gonna happen anytime soon, you guys, I know. So th this is a beautiful dream of, it's a Glenwood, it's a, tr it's a train in the 1920s coming out of, or 1919, coming out of the Glenwood Tunnel. And this is our, our tour that we had just two years ago. It's a great dream. I do really support it, but at the same time, it's definitely Scotts Valley. You're still gonna not have a railroad for a couple years longer at least. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone. <laughs>